Greetings, geekpreneurs. It's Ami from geekswhogetpaid.com. Today, I'm here speaking with Shannon May, who is an artist and illustrator and found some pretty impressive success on Kickstarter, launching her own line of enamel pins. So we're going to learn all about how she took her art from hobby to paying job and how Kickstarter helped her grow that success. So maybe you can do that if that's something that you're interested in as well. So let's dive right in. Hey, Shannon. Hi. <laughs> awesome. So um, once again, thank you so much for, for agreeing to do this interview. Um, today we're no going to be chatting a little bit about your work as an artist and an illustrator. And mm -hmm. um, also I'm going to want to talk a little bit about your Kickstarters that I noticed were really successful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but before I get into the, the nitty gritty of all of it, um, I got to learn a little bit more about you. So tell me about yourself, your hobbies, and how you got into the business of art and illustration. Sure. So, uh, hey, I'm Shannon May, and I live down in the UK. Um, I'm a self-professed <laughs> self fantasy geek. Um, when I'm not arting, as it were, is that a word? I don't know if arting is a word. It is now. Um, <laughs> my main hobbies are tabletop role playing, uh, mainly D and D and Thirteenth Age, and I play a f play a fair few video games. Uh, Final Fantasy fourteen, currently my favorite. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's that's about me. <laughs> awesome! Oh my gosh, Final Fantasy fourteen has such a special place in my heart. I love it. So much. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't played it a little bit. Um, mm. but now that the, the new expansion is happening, I've got to, I got to jump. Oh out. yes. <laughs> it looks so good. I know. I know. Um, so with your art and illustration, have you always kind of been artistically inclined or when did that? Yeah. I mean, sort of, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to articulate because it's always been a hobby ever since like I was a little girl. I think it is with a lot of people. Um, but before I went into art in a big way, I actually went to university to do computer science. No way. So um, it took me like years to realize that that wasn't really what I wanted long term. Like that's not to say programming can't be creative and fulfilling, but it, it wasn't really for me. So I guess that goes to prove you can always start again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amen to that. Awesome. So what did the kind of beginning of that journey look like? You had decided, okay, computer science isn't for me. So then what happened next? Uh, it started with me telling my parents and they weren't particularly happy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Going to be completely honest. Um, but my partner at the time was very supportive of it. Um, and I... I suppose I basically sort of started from scratch. I went into graphic design first uh, rather than illustration itself um, and went to work in a print shop and basically went up from there and started expanding. <laughs> now you do quite a few things. I see design is still one of them, but um, illustration. And then I'm personally a really big fan of your stickers and pens and stuff. Thank you. Um, <laughs> of course. So can you tell me a little bit, just kind of like a general overview of kind of what your business, your job looks like now? Uh, sure. Yeah, like uh, at first it was just me like freelancing, doing logos and brochures and leaflets, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I used that as like a bridge to my illustration and product design and thought, you know what? instead of designing things for other companies, uh, I should probably put my money where my mouth is and launch my own products. And that's what I've been doing with my RPG pin collections at the moment. I love them. I love them. <laughs> um, so before I ask you more about that, art is your full-time job now, yes? Uh, technically. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I do have a day job, but it's in magazine design. So I'm doing art and design all day long when I get home as well. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> You're living the dream. I like to think so. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, I know that you your hobbies are center around video games and D&D. &D, so it's it's pretty clear that, you know, that's that um, flavors the art and the pins and sticker designs and stuff definitely um so like did you was that just 
kind of like a passion pro like I'm going to design these things and see if it works or did you like know already that there was kind of like a demand out there for what you were doing or well I, I like I think if there's anything I can recommend to like aspiring business people is to do what you know or if there's a niche you don't know research it uh, extensively but I did the first thing um, like I've tried to keep up with trends in the past, you know, when there's this like, oh, everyone's drawing this. So I've got to draw this and then I'll get popular. It'll, it'll all work out. It'll be fine. Um, and there's something to be said for like short term fads and things. Uh, but yeah, going into a niche that I went well, knew well, um, and creating like evergreen products and stuff is, is a much better long term goal. And gaming was where I had a lot of experience. So I was way more sure of how to like market my products because I was essentially marketing to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that does make it easier. Making your own target audience. <laughs> so, okay. So you said the phrase evergreen products, um, which I think is actually a pretty cool thing to touch on. So what, what does that mean for the? No, so a, a, a product that isn't seasonal um, or isn't a fad, say like I'd make something for Christmas, it's only ever going to sell around Christmas. Uh, evergreen is something that people are going to want any time of year, any sort of event, because um, that's just make nice gifts. I, I, a lot of like the feedback I get is, oh, yeah, I, I gave it to my best friend's gran and it was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. So with your products, um, mm -hmm. I found you because I found your Kickstarters, um, mm -hmm. not that they're running right now, but um, saw that they were successful. So um, that's actually unique to me. I mean, I know people do it, but that's, I, I see a lot of Etsy shops. I see a lot of, you know, Shopify's, but very yeah. rarely do I see a Kickstarter for a physical product like that. So what made you choose that avenue? What was the story behind that? Um, I think the thing that really drew me to Kickstarter was that I wasn't pushing a lot of capital up front myself. Mm -hmm. It was more other people trusting me with their money, which is, is lovely. Um, and I'm re <laughs> really <laughs> glad that they did. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, my Kickstarter beginnings weren't all sunshine and rainbows. Um, I thought about running a Kickstarter for a while. Um, but I always kind of doubted myself, you know, worried that I wouldn't get funded and I just fall flat on my face and that would kind of suck. Yeah. Um, uh, so like some bad stuff happened in my personal life. I won't go into it. Um, mm -hmm. And I really, really needed something to get my mind off of it. Um, so it's kind of like a weird kind of motivation. Uh, so I planned a Kickstarter within a, like a couple of weeks, which wasn't ideal. I now know you, you really need a much bigger run up. <laughs> um, do as I say, not as I do. Um, so I planned it out, announced it on social media. And then draw during the campaign, I was like a marketing machine. <laughs> as soon as it hit my lunch break at work, I'd like be on Twitter. And then I go into all the Reddit subs and I'd be like, yeah, look, look at this cool Kickstarter. It's awesome, right? <laughs> um, and like it, it was through that and like help lots of help from my friends because I have a lot of friends in the same hobby space um and we got funded in two days and it was an amazing feeling <laughs> that's wild that is so cool okay so for for the uninitiated for anyone who's never done a kickstarter um what does the planning for that look like like what kind of prep did you have to do so the big part of planning is awareness um as much as Kickstarter has its own base of people who are going to be looking for things, um, and pins is definitely one of them, there are lots of pin collectors who deliberately browse Kickstarter just because they want some pins, yeah. which might be why you found it. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, um, the, the engagement factor is, is a really big one. Uh, planning out your social media campaign. Um, uh, for my second one, like I created an email list so that I had a list of people from the get go who were really interested. Um, building hype, hype. It is all about the hype with the Kickstarter because that's all you've got. Because uh, you might have uh, a prototype of a product, but you don't have anything final to show them. Um, so that's that's kind of all you've got. And building that trust is really important. Yeah. Did you already have a pretty good following on social media and stuff before you did your Kickstarter? 
yeah, it, it was all right. It wasn't for like pins and stationery and stuff specifically. Um, it was just around my art. Um, but fortunately, those two crossed over quite a bit. So yeah. it uh, ended up being okay. <laughs> yeah, because your art is also kind of centered around games and fantasy and stuff like that too, right? Oh, yeah. I I, I paint a lot of um, tabletop characters and stuff yeah. like that. Mostly my own. So people are like, who the heck is this? Uh, <laughs> no, they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, side quest. What What is your current D&D character? Or one of them, if you have multiple campaigns. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I... I'm in the unenviable position at the moment where I'm in three campaigns at the same oh. time and I, I probably shouldn't be it's a bit too much, but um, I'm trying. Um, but my favorite out of all of them and this will color me and I bet like my friends will watch this video and they'll be like, why not my campaign? You didn't pick <laughs> that one. Um, uh, I have a character called Piper Teldori and she is a purple fire Ganassi and I love her to bits. <laughs> Ganassi is so cool. They are. <laughs> I had a... I, um, Go ahead. Um, what, no, what I love about her most is um, that unlike a, a normal fire Ganassi, she has a potassium core, which is why she glows purple. <sighs> Which so there's science behind it too. <laughs> yes, science can have <laughs> Cool. Okay, I, I just had to add. When someone else plays D&D, I just have to know. <laughs> I feel like it says a lot about a person to, to learn about their D&D character, you know? Mm, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, so sorry. Back to the Kickstarter. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I'd love to hear a little bit more detail about the kind of different pieces that you mentioned. So um, you, a social media campaign, email list. So I, well, I'm not gonna, I won't bundle them together. So starting to do a social media campaign. Um, what, what did that look like? Like what kind of posts were you doing? What was your cadence like? How do you go into subreddits without sounding annoying? Oh yeah, that's really hard. <laughs> um, uh subreddits I, I will say now for anyone thinking of doing something like this the D, most of the D subreddits reddits are actually quite nice as long as you tell the mods ahead of time uh they'll be like sure you can promote this and i'm like yeah that's great thank you <laughs> um so so that was nice to find out um what did my social media okay the, the one big thing that i did do with my social media campaign that i actually started doing about halfway through but i've kept doing since because it worked quite well is i did them as a series of quests to unlock the next pin oh so that worked quite well like i had drawings of my characters on there giving people quests and saying yeah we need to find this mythical i think i had like uh the dice of natural ones or something like that um, and we have to go find this. And then once the pin had been unlocked and thing, I had another post up, uh, which would say, thank you, adventurers, <laughs> for unlocking this pin. Here we go. <laughs> That's so fun. I love that. <laughs> they got to go on the adventure to get the pin. Yep. <laughs> Very cool. And then your your email list. That's kind of notoriously difficult to do is to build an email list. Yeah. You get so much email. So how did you go about that? So for my first one, signups was like pulling teeth, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, but that's kind of expected. Yeah. Um, and then at the end of the first one, uh, in my, um, at the end of the thing, you, you'll send out a survey uh, to all your backers, uh, asking what pins they want, their addresses, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things you're also allowed to do is you're allowed to ask if you can put their email uh, onto your email list for future things. And that's basically how I built it since then. It's been the easiest way um, because people who back something on Kickstarter are more likely to back something else because they trust the brand itself. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, did you get any feedback along the way, comments or, you know, how the discussion happens on Kickstarter before anything actually comes out? What did that discussion look like for yours? Um, to be fair, I didn't see a lot of discussion sort of myself until afterwards, which was quite funny. Like <laughs> I'd be in a, <laughs> um, like I'd be in a Facebook group, um, 
uh, I, I can't remember what it was at, at the time, but um, it was like a dice making one or something. And then suddenly I'd see something pop up and they'd be like, look at this cool pin that I just backed. It's awesome. And and I, 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 I looked at it and I was like, that's mine. So I started <laughs> searching my name on like other groups and yeah. finding out that other people have been talking about it. And that's that's why it blew up. Not necessarily just because of what I was doing, um, but because other people were sharing with their friends and just that kind of power is something that I definitely can't do on my own. Yeah. Uh, and that's like, that's part luck, right? Like you just hit. Mm. You yeah. hit something with people and you can't make people share stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so um, second Kickstarter, we talked a little bit about this, but what were mm-hmm. some things that, other than the email list, that you did differently that second time around or lessons that you learned from the first one um when when I was doing the second one um I gave it a a much bigger run-up for for a start um it was about three months before I actually launched the campaign that I was posting pictures of the artwork and stuff um on it as well and getting feedback from people as to the designs and things like that um, which was something I didn't do as much of in the first one, because I was just sort of like, these are the designs, I'm going to throw them at you and hope you like them. Um, uh, but I would actually say I ran the first one better than the second one in some ways. Oh, really? Which was very interesting. Yeah, no, I like I deliberately tried to like jumble things up a little bit. Um, like for my second one, it was all like the same pin, but in different colors. Because I was like, yeah, people will want, pe- people prefer different colors and certain things. Um, I, I did, because they were, they were dice goblins. Um, and I, I built a character around each one. But the pins themselves were basically just the same pin, but with different colors. Like there was a yeah. rainbow one and a purple one. They were all very nice. Um, uh, but the problem was, is, is, in the first Kickstarter, I found a lot of people would just be like, yeah, I'll back the entire collection. Whereas for this one, people were like, this is my favorite color. I'll just have one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I stumbled a little bit. It still did really well. But um, yeah, like there's there's definitely things to, to, to take from both of those. Interesting. Okay. So I had a question about that. Oh, um, did you have to learn anything new or teach yourself anything to get this Kickstarter you like from start to finish? Like how did you, with the making of the pins, how did you organize that? Did you? Mm. Uh, that is definitely something I've never done before. I, I haven't liaised like directly with a manufacturer for things. Um, and it's not the easiest thing in the world to end up with the product that you want. Um, you'll often have to go through like several several phases of making sure that what they're because because like as much as I have this vision in my mind of what I want they they're not going to have exactly the same vision Um, I I imagine that happens with with uh, all products not just pins um, which at some point maybe I'll find out so we'll see (laughs) (laughs) so who did you work with to make the pins can I ask that um yeah um I I worked with a you know what, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, there's a, a Chinese manufacturer, a middleman that went to a Chinese manufacturer, because at the time um, I was kind of worried about quality control and things like that. So I was like, I really want someone else to be able to handle this for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and also there's, there's obviously language barriers there and things like that. Of course. Um, yeah. It's like I, I would have loved to be able to... to hire like a local manufacturer but unfortunately they don't exist <laughs> really um yeah and enamel pins are one of these very specific things um and i can't remember exactly why i, I mean uh, one of the things is obviously cost they're just like it's not cost effective to produce it in this country so they don't yeah. um but i think there is actually a legality thing it's something to do with like money printing or something like, like um gilding coins in the process Oh, okay. Interesting. Like, like, yeah, apparently one of the processes in making an enamel pin is also using counterfeiting coins. So it's, it's not legal or something like that. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the strange things you find on the internet. Because I was like, why can't I find one in this country? It's like, no, they just won't do it. 
That's wild. Okay, I would have yeah. never known that. <laughs> so were you pleased with the product once it finally got done, once it got to you? Yeah, definitely. Like I, I would say the first time I, I went through a middleman and then the second time I didn't. Uh, I, I did everything myself, which um, was interesting. But um, uh, yeah, no, no, they got here and they were lovely. Um, I did have some problems the second time round where they did have to get sent back and I did have to um, did have to put my foot down on some quality control. But uh, what was yeah, like every, um, it was uh, specifically because um, there's this. Uh, process called electroplating mm -hmm. which um which makes the the really nice rainbow effect pins um and they basically started flaking off when they got it and i was like oh no like i can't really send these out guys yeah um okay. so they, those were a bit delayed and at the same time uh, as i was doing all this fulfillment um covid hit so everything kind of went out the window um but yeah, like it's all fine now. We're all good. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you noticed the flaking off before it went. Oh, yeah, other people noticed the flaking off. Yeah, <laughs> lucky. <laughs> wow. Okay, so fulfillment side. Mm. Um, once the pens are done, they're ready to go out to backers. Do they come to you and you do all the shipping, or what does that look like? Yes. That, that is me sitting in my office for several days, <laughs> packaging tiny pins oh. into tiny little bags and then signing like one to 200 pieces of paper with thank yous. Yeah. <laughs> um, th that was how I did it. Um, for my second one, I did actually have to get like a friend to help me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, all the fulfillment I, I basically did on my own, which was uh, interesting. <laughs> That's a full-time job all by itself. Mm -hmm. So okay, so how many how many backers did you have for both of them? Do you remember? Um, do you know what? I don't. I can check. I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm like trying to imagine <laughs> how many little bags. You know. <laughs> Let's have a look. See, on the first one, it was two hundred and thirty. Wow. That's so it was, a, it was a lot of little packages. <laughs> a lot of little pins. No, I was not kidding around. Gosh, what an amazing turnout, though. <clears throat> yeah, no, like, it it just blew all of my expectations, honestly. Yeah. I, I expected, like, maybe I'd eke out just, like, the first goal, and then I'd be happy because, yeah, I would have made some pins, and I'd done some art, cool art stuff. Yeah. And then it just kept going up. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, with the, you know, when you kind of blew your goal out of the water, that extra money that came in, did that all have to go toward cost or did you get to apply that to other places in your life and business and stuff? Um, what happened with it is as uh, as the Kickstarter got more, and it, it was up to a point because um, it was going to get silly with the amount of like different pins I'd made, but I ended up having to design some more pins on the fly during the campaign uh, mm -hmm. as it got higher so that basically there was more of a selection for backers. Um, but yeah, after everything was over, I basically ended up plumbing what was left uh, into my business um, and into a... I think I, I, I did a, a new line of, um, there's, there's a, a pin called the Dice Hoarder, which is a little dragon. Yeah. Um, and then I, I basically used the rest of it to do him in lots of different colors. Yeah. Um, so that, that was basically what I did. But basically to launch a second pin line, I um, I used the extra for that. <laughs> okay. Nice. It self-perpetuates. Yeah. Okay. So... Back to kind of your broader business as an artist. Um, yeah. This is a kind of a general question, but one that's just fun. Um, what would you say is your most triumphant moment as an artist and your most difficult moment? Oof. Um, I think my most triumphant moment was also my most difficult moment. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> So um, I, I mentioned earlier that I table at comic and gaming conventions, you know, when they were actually running. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of one of them, I was asked to be on a panel of artists. 
um, to like answer crowd questions and talk about what I do. Um, it was like a scary thought, but I, I honestly felt honored that they'd even asked. Yeah. Um, so I said yes. And then it got to the day and I realized who I'd be on the panel with. Um, so it turned out to be the original artist of War Machine, Kev Hopgood, uh, and the guy that sculpted Darth Vader's mask. <laughs> and I was like, like, talk about imposter syndrome. <laughs> I was way out of my element. <laughs> like, it, it was fun. Like, like they, they were both lovely, by the way. But um, they were like listing off their accolades. And I was like, what on earth can I say? <laughs> I can't match this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is I'm fun. anxiety <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> so, okay, so what happened? Like, you just went up there? And yeah, like, yeah. I, I went up there and did my thing. I mean, to be honest, most of the questions were, like, inevitably about Iron Man and Star Wars. Uh, so I, I I think sometimes, like, they felt sorry for me and passed <laughs> questions over to me. It's like, people don't want to know. They, <laughs> they're not here for me. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. What can they? But yeah, uh, I'd say like that's yeah my favorite moment, but also definitely the most difficult position that I've been put in as an artist. Oh my goodness. Okay. What what convention was that? Uh, this was Bromley Sci-Fi Con. It was like a couple of years ago. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Wow. That's man. You share a stage with those people. That's so cool. <laughs> Um, there was something in there that I wanted to touch on. Let me see if I can remember. Oh yeah. So, um, you, with the tables that you know, selling your products at conventions, mm -hmm. um, and you also have a website and your social media and the Kickstarter, what is kind of the, the most successful leg of your business or are they all pretty equal? They all work together. Uh, I mean, definitely at the moment, the online thing is, uh, a plus of but, um, uh, yeah, conventions are really good for getting your name out there uh, regardless of if if you make a lot of money or anything on them um, I I found a lot of people will come back to your website and just buy something later um, mm -hmm. because they remember you or you'll go to one convention then you go to another one and the same people will be there because nerd circles are smaller than we think <laughs> and they'll recognize you and be like hey <laughs> Yeah. Um, and it does, it's just really nice. <laughs> awesome. So I just have to ask, how do you prepare for, like, if, if someone wanted to, to sell at a convention, they've never done it before, well, how, how does that work? Um, I'd say, like, one of the biggest things to do is always make sure you plan out your space effectively. Uh, once you've obviously signed up and everything, you've got your table. Um, one of the most important things is space. Um, so one of the things I used to do is I used to go down in my living room and uh, I was younger at the time. I lived with my dad and he absolutely hated me because I'd set up my little table in the living room and all of my little grid cubes where I display all my art prints and just put it all up just to make sure that when I got there, I'd be able to build it really quickly um, and everything would stay up because I have had unfortunate times where the display has just fell down fortunately not on other people um, fun times um but I, i'd say that's the most important part of it um also make sure you take plenty of like snacks and drinks because you will be there a while and you might think you'll be fine you'll just be able to get up and grab something from a stall it's probably not going to happen um, and number three uh if you can take another person um, you're going to need those bathroom breaks. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Awesome. So, okay. Um, the biggest question from all of this stuff, and we've touched on a, on a few of these along the way, but let's say you meet an artist that really wants to start getting paid for their stuff, um, whether it's prints or pins or stickers or whatever it is. What is the number one biggest piece of advice that you would give to them? I would say jump. Um, 
I stopped myself jumping for a very long time. I went back and forth with ideas I wanted to do and never really put my all in the, uh, into them over the years. Uh, I'd say a Kickstarter is a really good way to jump, um, especially if you're in a position where like the financial risk of creating products is stopping you making the leap. Because um, as I, I mentioned earlier, you're only like losing your time and pride if um, if something goes wrong and it doesn't get funded. Um, and you can always try again. Like you, you don't always blow up the first time, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. Just jump. <laughs> Super. Well, um, I think that wraps up a lot of my questions. But is there anything that you wanted to mention, plug, promote, talk about? Um, Where- I have just started a YouTube channel. Hey, yay! So, <laughs> what is that? New things. Um, so I started a channel where I do speed paints of all my work oh. um, and with like art tips and commentary and I plan on doing some tutorials and things. Um, it's very early days at the moment, but it's there and it'll be really cool if people checked it out. So <laughs> Awesome. I will link it. And yay. then where where else can people find you if they're interested in your art? Uh, people can find me at shannonmay.art or I am at Shannon May Art on pretty much every social media. <laughs> cool. I will link them. I will link them so everyone can find them. Well, thank you so much for shedding some light behind the scenes of what it's like to be a professional artist. I really appreciate it. No, that's great. Thank you for having me. Of course. <laughs> and there you have it. Thank you so much to Shannon for making the time to speak with all of us today. Don't forget to check the links in the description to follow her on her social media and um, other channels. And if you liked this interview and you want more where it came from, visit us at geekswhogetpaid.com or you can subscribe to this channel or podcast wherever you're listening. And we will launch content every single week, interviews usually every other week. But always from someone new and geeky and fun to learn from. So I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye, Geekpreneurs.